Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 154. I've been on the road pretty much on a constant basis since the beginning of the year, and I'm having a blast getting to meet so many Genealogy Gems listeners around the world. I kicked off the year in Mesa, Arizona at the Family History Expo, then headed across the pond to speak at Who Do You Think You Are live in London, the huge genealogy conference there. Then there was the Southern California Genealogical Society webinar that was on time travel with Google Earth. If you're a premium member, and I hope that you are, then perhaps you've had a chance to take a look at that premium video. We recorded that particular webinar um, because we really rocked our ancestors' world in that one. Then I was off to Salt Lake City, first to teach some YouTube marketing strategies at the Association of Professional Genealogists, and then we headed straight into Roots Tech, which once again was bigger and better than ever. After seeing tons of you at Roots Tech, I've been to Lakeland, Florida for a full day seminar to a very enthusiastic group of genealogists. And then from the balmy weather of Florida up to the snowy white north of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, where the Alberta Genealogical Society once again outdid themselves with another terrific conference. I had the privilege of bringing the great Google Earth Genealogy Game Show to their banquet. And boy, was that a hoot. After Alberta, I was off to Cincinnati, Ohio, which is home of Family Tree Magazine. And as you know, I host the Family Tree Magazine podcast. So I got a chance to catch up with Allison Dolan, the magazine's publisher, and all the folks at Family Tree Magazine, um, as we were all there for the Ohio Genealogical Society Conference. Are you tired yet? (laughs) I am just a little bit, as I've just gotten home from Cincinnati. But there's a lot more genealogy fun to come this weekend as I head out to Memphis, Tennessee. I'll be doing a full-day seminar for the Tennessee Genealogical Society this Saturday, and from there, it's off to Las Vegas. Sort of kind of feeling uh, an Elvis theme there, don't you think? And that's for the National Genealogical Society Conference. You can check out all my upcoming live events on my website at genealogygems.com. Just click the Seminars tab in the menu. Now, if you didn't get a chance to attend a genealogy event this year, don't fret, because in today's episode, while I'm going to get back to my laundry and packing for Tennessee, you're going to hear two recordings that we did at Roots Tech. First up is Jay Jordan. He's the president of OCLC, which you may know as WorldCat. We got a chance to sit down at Roots Tech to chat about their new partnership with FamilySearch, which is going to bring the FamilySearch catalog to WorldCAD. And then you're going to hear 10 top tips for how to bust through your genealogy brick wall. The winner of the Roots Tech registration that we gave away here on the Genealogy Gems blog, Sarah Stout, got an opportunity to sit down with me and Canadian genealogy guru Dave Obi to talk about her brick wall, which spanned the Canadian and the U.S. border. But really, the locations weren't the important part here. The 10 tips that Dave dished up can really be used by every family historian to achieve genealogy success. So sit back and relax, and let's head back to Roots Tech. Today, here at Roots Tech 2013 is Jay Jordan. He's the president and CEO of OCLC. Welcome to the show, Jay. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Now, I was going to say the full name, but you said, no, most people will know this by OCLC, but tell right. us what the full name is of the company. Uh, Online Computer Library Center. Right. That's what the OCLC stands for. Now, the name I always think about is WorldCat and yes. WorldCat.org. Right. What's the relationship between OCLC and WorldCat? 
Well, World, WorldCat is really kind of the, the center of everything we do there. Uh, it was the founding principle of OCLC to build this shared resource for libraries when it was founded. Uh, WorldCat was actually turned on as a database in 1971. So it, it contains now uh, you know, almost two billion holdings from libraries in, in, uh, around the world. So we operate in 170 countries and there's about 70,000 libraries that, that do some form of cataloging or resource sharing or s interact with OCLC. Exactly. And you know, I know a lot of you who have listened to the show or uh, even in my book, How to Find Your Family History in Newspapers, I do a whole section on WorldCat because it is such an incredible resource and it's not just public libraries. We're talking corporate libraries, universities. It really broadens the reach of where we might look for resources. Yeah. I think, uh, and beyond that, so it's got many, many university libraries from around the world, but increasingly we have national library collections. Oh, uh, cool. And we have something called Archive Grid, which is 5,000 archives representing 2 million collections in Archive Grid. So there really is a lot more to mine there uh, than just uh, what you would think of as a book collection in a public library, yes. The world's largest card catalog, right? Yeah, that's right. Now, some, I'm sure many of those collections come to you because you're working together with international partnerships. This indeed. is a, a global card catalog, if you will, is it not? It, it is, indeed. It's, and yeah. has that always been the focus, or did you start focusing here in the U.S. and well, move your way out? Yeah, it's, the founder was hired to, to create a, a, a more useful model in Ohio, initially, just in, in the 54 colleges and universities there. Then it turned out to be a pretty good idea. So the folks over in Pennsylvania said, hey, can we get in on this, and so on. So it, it kind of moved out from the, its founding birthplace in Ohio. Uh, and increasingly, we've really pushed hard to make sure that those great international collections are represented in it. So increasingly, it's become a global resource. And we have lots of more work to do ahead of us, too. Incredible. And the reason that I really wanted to snag Jay and have him meet with me here and talk with you is because they've got something really exciting going in terms of partnerships with Family Search. And of course, Family Search is sponsoring Roots Tech, which is bigger and better than ever. Were you here last year? No, I wasn't. This is my first one. <laughs> they moved everything around, so we're all still looking for the doors. Yeah. But who wants to leave, right? Um, but Jay, tell us about the partnership with the Family History Library specifically yeah. and their catalog. Well, we're we're very excited. I, I think on both sides. We all I think are. I can well I think I can speak for family search on yeah. this one too. Uh, we've talked about it for quite some time. Uh, it's a very logical relationship. Uh, we're both, you know, inf information organizations interested in providing much lowering the barriers of access to information. Right. Uh, specifically uh, that which is housed in libraries or that which has to do with family history. So I think the symbiosis that's, that can be achieved with this relationship is we haven't even imagined how exciting this can be. So libraries will drive traffic to, you know, a, a, a serendipitous discovery of somebody using a library will drive traffic to Family Search and all of their assets. And by the same token, somebody in Family Search will be linked into WorldCat into libraries. So it might say, gee, were you aware that that? particular object is available to you at your public library, which is exactly two blocks away from your house. That is one of the coolest features of WorldCat. I love that it reorganizes the listings geographically, so you know, even though you might be looking for something across the country, it turns out it's at the university down the road, right. and, and you've got access yeah. to it. Now, Family History Library, in, as my understanding is, traditionally, they have not done interlibrary loan with public libraries. Uh, and so, some, I think they have a few special a few partnerships. Special things. But so when we find something on WorldCat yeah. and it says, hey, this is something that's with the Family History Library, this is then, I guess, just pointing them to exactly. how you would access it, even exactly. if it isn't through interlibrary yes. loan. Well, and you know the Family History Centers, there's you know almost 5,000 Family History Centers around the world. Right. So part of my imagination says, not only is there a public library down the street, but if you're really interested in pursuing serious genealogical research, how about there's a, you know, family history center yes. in the next town over? It was interesting. Someone stopped by our stand today and said, well, I don't get the WorldCat thing and what it does for me. And I said, well, you know, let, you're doing research and 
He says, yeah, I get that, but what if the only copy's in Denmark? What good does that do me in Utah? I said, well, that's an interesting question. I said, number one, I said, at least you know it exists. Yes. That's, you know, a big net gain there. And you may choose to vacation in Copenhagen so you can access some register that's of interest to your research. I said, more, more importantly, increasingly libraries and the family uh, search and everybody else are starting to collaborate. So if it's out of copyright, that library may be kind enough to scan the document and email it to your public library or the Family History Center. Exactly. So I said, don't give up just because it's in Denmark. Well, I love it too because um, we can do a little more homework before, occasionally we need to engage the services of a professional genealogist who might be in Denmark, mm -hmm. but how nice to know when you're doing that, I've already targeted some things that I'd like you to be able to, exactly. to pursue for me, yeah. and what else is there. It really broadens our scope of what's available. Right. How did it all start? Did you go to them? Did they go to you? Uh, How did you know there was going to be that's a, a good question? I think connection. they I think they actually pinged us first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'll give them all the credit. Uh, but you know they 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 just thought about this. They knew uh, WorldCat was you know the most used database in higher education year right. over year over right. year. So they're like, wait a minute, there's huge assets in these libraries. Um, you know why don't we strike up a relationship? So we started these conversations some time ago. Uh, and you know, got comfortable with each other and so on, and then figured out exactly what the construct might look like. And then, of course, we got the lawyers involved. <laughs> but we have actually got and the still documents. Made it. It's still going to happen. Still made it. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody worked very hard on the agreement. So. Well, and one of the advantages they have, thinking of it from the terms of genealogy, is they're going to have a lot of surnames associated with materials. Mm -hmm. WorldCat doesn't necessarily come from that perspective, but. What I thought would be kind of fun is, you know, you do your, your general WorldCat search, and while it says Family History Library, there's a couple of other libraries. Am I correct in thinking that maybe the Family History Library listing might give me a little more to work with to make that decision whether going to my local library to get the book I, is worthwhile? I think oftentimes that will be the case. Yeah. But interestingly, there's, there's a lot more names in WorldCat than you might imagine. Really? Okay. Yeah, so we have a bunch, we won't go into the details today, but there's there's something called WorldCat Identities, which are machine derived. So these wonderfully standard mark records that librarians have put in for all these years, we've been data mining them with, with algorithms and have created upward of 25 million unique identity pages. Wow. So yes, Albert Einstein has one, so does Sherlock okay. Holmes. So, so they're really subjects, not real right, people. Right. But there's a lot of proper names and surnames in there. There's another service we have called the Virtual International Authority File, where we have these the uh, authoritative person name authority files from uh -huh. places like the National Library of France uh, uh -huh. and, and 22 other agencies, the Library of Congress, National Library of France, National Library of Germany. So we have a huge store of names so that they can be disambiguated. Okay. So I think that will work both ways. I, I think most of this relationship will be symbiotic, so mm -hmm. benefits will accrue going both ways. So now everybody out there who's watching is thinking, when is this happening? When do <laughs> I get to see the merger yeah. when I do my search? Well, now the work begins, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so you get, all, get through the process stuff and get the documents. So that's why one of the reasons we're here. Uh, and I really have, I'm blown away by the size of this thing. The third year and we get yeah. 6,700 yeah. people. and. 2,000 young people coming in on Saturday. So uh, I, we're doing that just now to say, okay, what would give the greatest lift to both parties, but mostly to anybody interested in genealogical research, what would give the greatest lift the fastest? We have to get the data piece right. You right. Know, data quality is what it's all about, obviously. So we don't want broken links, we don't want dead ends. So we've really got to figure that out first. And then I think there's all kinds of adjunct benefits that we can bring to bear. Uh, both from Family Search and from OCLC. Is it going to be kind of a uh, bring it out in waves? Is it going to be yeah. one big launch, do you think? No, well, I, I think it, we're going to have to do it sequentially. Yeah. So I think the data piece we should probably try to bring out. You know, we need critical mass of data, so we don't want to dribble that out. So I think we'll get the data piece done and, you know, make a, a, a big launch with that. And then as we figure out these ancillary benefits, that we can bring those out in a, as features are released every you know, quarter, or however we can figure out how to do the engineering. Right. Wow. So, so with 
this coming online, and I, I'm assuming we're going to see some things in 2013, or do you think it's going to move into 2014? Uh, you know, I, I, that's what we're working on right oh, now. Yeah, yeah. And again, it depends on how we prioritize the launch and what we choose to do. Right. How, how big a chunk we want to try to digest. Is this the one main project, or what else does OCLC have going on? Are you... Well, we, we, do, things? we do lots of data ingest, obviously, yeah. Yeah. Uh, daily, millions and millions of records a, a day. Wow. So it's really not a pipeline issue. Um, there's always other projects going on. And, you know, we could say the same thing about family service. They have right. lots of things going on. So, But I think we're both enthused about this. The management of both companies, all the way up to the top, uh, are, are really enthused. So we'll get something done, and I really do hope there's going to be something you know, really exciting out there in 2013. Absolutely. I'm curious, just on a personal note, mm -hmm. how long have you been with them, and um, how did you end up coming to OCLC? I, I'm this. I'm in my 15th year. I'll complete my 15th year as CEO uh, okay. in May. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to retire in June. Oh. Yeah. So 15 years. Uh, it's time for a change. You're leaving of, a great mark. You know, well, having know this merger. That. The next person will come in and say, "My heavens, why didn't he do all this stuff?" <laughs> So anyway, um, I, I'm, I'm a great believer in rotation of leadership, so yeah. it's time for somebody else to figure this out. Um, and, and I came there, I was running an information company in Colorado for years, okay. uh, and somebody called me up and said, you don't want to look at the Rocky Mountains anymore, you want to move to Ohio, don't you? <laughs> and work for a library organization. I almost hung up the phone, but, yeah. but thank goodness I didn't. It's been just a wonderful, wonderful organization to work for. And, you know, you go to work and feel good every day. Because you're lowering the barrier to access to information and driving costs down for libraries, which is our public purpose as a 501c3. There's so much fear that libraries will go away in yes. the digital age, but that's really not the case, is it? It's just the delivery systems change. And yeah. Well, you know, it's it, everything has, you know, everybody and all the agencies have to adapt. So, right. so the library's value within the, the academy, the, the academic setting is different and will continue to change. I, you know, I think the value there is is sustainable. Absolutely, it'll be different. I think public libraries are under huge pressure, budget pressures. Yeah. Let's close the branches. Everything's online. Well, everything isn't online. No. We're nowhere near that. Genealogists know that very well. Right. So I think we have to do a better job of messaging and re recalibrating the value proposition of the public library, of, of the corporate library in that case, of the national library, uh, and certainly the university libraries. So, yes, that's, but people have been talking about that for years. Um, and, you know, it, it, I don't want to only have Google as my mechanism to find things. Thank you. Exactly. And that's not a exactly. slam. We have a great partnership with Google, but I don't want that as my only option. Right. We need that diversity of the I mean, that's a commercially driven enterprise. Thank you. So, <laughs> exactly. How, how exactly do you get above the fold? Well, um, so, so that's a business thing, and, a and neither Family Search nor OCLC is a business thing. Right. You know, we're we're institutions that are interested in providing full and and, and authentic access to information around the world. So I, I think it's a very, very logical and very exciting relationship. It's, it's perfect. When I saw the press release across yeah. my desk, I went, "Yay!" You know, a happy yeah. dance because. That is just, it, it just makes so much sense. If it you does. haven't checked out worldcat.org, you've got to do it to see what they're doing. Jay Jordan, thank you so much for thank visiting you, Lisa, me today. Thank you, Lisa, for having Appreciate this discussion it. with me. is the winner of a Roots Tech 2013 registration. Now, if you've listened to the podcast, you know we had a little contest uh, before the conference rolled around, and I was asking folks who they most wanted to hear from here at the show. And our winner is Sarah Stout. Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> nice to see you here. And of course, when Sarah emailed me, um, she was talking about some Canadian research that you were doing and some challenges, and I thought, she said that she wanted to go to Dave Opie's class here at Roots Tech. So, of course, I got my little wheels spinning and realized i got to get these two together. And maybe those of you out there with Canadian research would also benefit from a little one-on-one -on -one consultation. So, here joining us is Dave Opie. 
Canadian expert and the author, of course, Destination Canada. And tell us also, you just received a doctorate, did you not? Yes, I have an honorary doctor of laws from the University of Victoria in British Columbia based on my work as a journalist, as a historian, and a genealogist. All three are mentioned in the citation. Fantastic. And, and tell us, of course, where your journalism area lies. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Times Colonist in Victoria, British Columbia. And I've, I've been a journalist now for about 40 years, and I've been working on genealogy for about 37 years. So really, it's all they're, they're one and the same thing. But it's a matter of getting collecting information and processing it for other people to use. Exactly. Researching today, researching yesterday. Yep. Have I got the right guy for you? Oh, I think sure. so. <laughs> okay, so what I want you to do, Sarah, is share with the audience and, of course, recap with Dave what some of your challenges were in your personal research. Okay, well, um, I started with an ancestor, um, and her name was Elizabeth Josephine, and we had a surname, and then we found, um, sorry, we found a, a surname in some books, and it was Brown, and then um, we found a death certificate that seemed like it would go, and it was the right time, right place, and it had Macaulay, so I kind of ruled it out until I started researching her uncle that she grew up with in the census records in Canada. And so um, there was an Elizabeth Macaulay there. And so I got to thinking again that maybe perhaps this could be her as well. And nothing really proves it yet, but it, that's where I'm kind of tossing and turning. Is she a Brown or is she a Macaulay? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where <laughs> the situation is, I guess. <laughs> Diving through all of the records on, on that, you, you've given me a variety of different different documents and so on, a summary of the entire case. It's it's I find it fascinating. This this is one that I think sort of pushes the very, very limit of credibility, just okay. in terms of how cool it all is. Um, the connection, the strong connection to Atlantic Canada, to Montana. She dies in Arizona many years later, like it's all over the map basically. And just the number of different connections there are. Um, the number of marriages that she had, um, and possibly another liaison that she had, like this, 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 this uncle. Maybe it's not really, really her uncle. William Seward Brown might have been the father of her first child. Now that could be the family connection. Well, you know, so it all gets to be very, very interesting. And again, it really pushes the limit. But again, I've checked as far as all the records I've checked. It all seems to check out. Which, which means you've got a great story. I wish, I wish <laughs> these people were my ancestors. <laughs> Many other people have been doing research on this line. Uh, their, 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 their work is on ancestry, family tree, that kind of thing. Um, I, you have to be careful about that kind of thing because you don't know who is simply sharing information back and forth. A lie repeated over and over is still a lie, that kind of thing. It's not confirmation that it's true. Um, that said, there are some things that you could be doing to sort of make sure that you're on the right track. Um, I think this is a classic example, a classic case for a, a timeline, You're putting everything down, her life, and, and some timelines, when you talk about a timeline, you talk about putting her life in the context of everything else happening. Yeah. I think, in, in this case, her life, everything, everything that you have solid, concrete about her life, start to finish, get it all down there, including uh, date, location, and what the event was, that kind of thing. It's, okay. a, it'll, it's a natural because you've, you've got such a, a wild story, you've got so much to sort of explain here. The timeline will help it, and the timeline also makes it much easier for you to see the holes, any holes that there might be. Um, another thing that you should be doing, um, I, I tell people that they can't do proper genealogical research unless they understand geography. And you've got some pretty wild geography. <laughs> yeah. Again, you know, fascinating guy, you know, crossing, crossing the Atlantic all the time back in the 1860s, uh, 1870s, 1880s, etc. And then, you know, one of the pioneers in, in Montana. Wow. <laughs> and, and she was married to both these guys. And allegedly, she got to know the guy from Montana because she, she, filed, she sent a letter off to a Lonely Hearts type newspaper. It gets really interesting. Oh. You know, like just the different <laughs> connections. And so so you, you, you could probably do research for the rest of your life on this one person and not get it all. Yeah. Um, it's, it can be possible. Check which newspapers had Lonely Hearts type things, which national publications there were. Try to find his ad. Try to find her ad. See yeah. what there is. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's not impossible. I was told one time about a connection in Ladies Home Journal. Someone was inspired to do something because of an article in Ladies Home Journal and I tracked it down. It, you know, it was 10 years, she, it was a back issue, so I didn't know the exact date, but 10 years before she read it, there was a, a, a piece was published in Ladies Home Journal, and, and that makes the story come alive when you can say that, hey, that was what motivated it. Anyway, geography, I think you really have to, have to 
pay really strong attention to geography, get a, get a big map of, of most of North America, show her, place her where she was at different times, okay. even do put arrows on it to show her movement back and forth. And again, see which records would have happened all along the way. You want every possible reference you can get to this woman uh, and her husband's. Uh, you want to find all that you can, and because you know, from 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 New York to Atlantic Canada to Montana, back to Connecticut to Arizona, that's a lot of travel. And every time she changed addresses, she she she, she changed husbands as well. It seems so, like it's <laughs> almost, it's, almost, yeah, almost. Yeah. towards the end. She got. I think she was getting tired. What a, anyway, um, but 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 it's worth doing that just to sort of keep track of all that. And 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 the reason you're doing both the timeline and the geographical mapping is to look for other sources, look for other things that you might have missed, and also just confirm everything that you're doing all, every step along the way. This is also, I think, a classic example of the need for newspaper research, especially in Newcastle, New Brunswick, which is where the, where the family was for a while. Yeah. Um, New Brunswick uh, civil registration documents are not the best. I've got ancestors there, I've got relatives there, and, and they don't appear in the, in the records. Um, and, and so you're dealing with a time period when things might be a bit flaky, the census might be a bit flaky. Yeah. Remember how the Canadian census was put together. It's not necessarily made up of people of the people who were in the household that night. It's the people who should have been there. Okay. And, and people who are just visiting overnight will not appear in the census, even though you know, the opposite is true in other areas. Uh, so be, be aware of that. Just because you don't find him in the census doesn't mean he wasn't living there. Yeah. But he, he might have just missed the, the cutoff in some way. Um, I would I would dig into the newspapers in from Newcastle. I would read basically for it's a small town. I'd read every local story, just see what you can find. Yeah, I'm sure you'll find many references to William Seward Brown. He was very very active. I think you'll find a lot of information doing that. Um, and the really tough part, locals always know more than people at say the the the, the library here, for instance. Yeah. Locals know more. So get in contact with the, any local historical society, the genealogical society there, any, of, any people there who might know some trivia or might know some dirt. I, I was stymied one time on one of my research projects um, in Virginia. I couldn't find any, find any record of, of, of deaths of my, of my relatives in Virginia. And when I went to the library in Manassas, Virginia, they said, you should try this farmer's diary. He recorded everything in it. And I looked in their transcript of a farmer's diary, and it had the deaths of my relatives. Wow. I would not have thought of looking at that. You yeah. know, but the locals, the locals know these sources. The locals have a better idea of this kind of thing. If you possibly can go there, go there. Because you'll learn a lot more just walking. It's a small enough place. Um, like the, the, the concept that, 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 that the border was somehow fluid or whatever at the time was true, like between Canada and the U.S. Okay. But Newcastle isn't that close to the border, so he yeah. wouldn't have been going over for coffee and crossing the border. These <laughs> yeah. people, you know, so so you'd have to sort of check that out. It's it's a, it's far enough from the border that 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 you should be looking exclusively in that area. It's off to one side. It, it's it's good, good for that. And the other thing I would do, and this is one of the reasons why your research could take the rest of your life, because you're dealing in some in some cases with relatively common names, like Brown and Johnson and so on. You, you pretty well have to do almost negative proof. You have to be looking, say you find someone uh, in one census you think is your right person, check in other censuses. Even though your person has gone to say Montana, you check back where she lived and make sure there is no one of that name still there. And yeah. do, that, do that for every sort of movement, every change in name. Okay. Um, that should, you know, because as, as I say, this is one of the most incredible and likely true stories I've ever seen. You know, yeah. I've seen incredible stories that uh, that you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't prove. This one looks good to me. Um, so you're going to have to actually have that kind of evidence as well. That the, the, you know, when you can't find anyone else to match that description, that helps prove the prove the case that you're trying to make. Um, again, I think that one of the major problems that you're facing is to find references to more of the husbands. Um, newspapers might help. If it, the one guy was apparently a sailor, if he would died at sea, killed somewhere elsewhere, whatever, the local newspaper probably has something. Whether the, whether the local library, the museum has an index of the newspaper, that would help as well. Okay. But 
many many things along that line and of course I know that you're in contact already with people on Ancestry who've done a lot of research on this family as well so just hope you can all work together and yeah. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that you all have the same sort of passion for genealogical standards of evidence as well because you've got to be careful when so many people are working on the same thing always be careful of that okay. Okay. Great yes. advice. What yeah, do you think? Thank you. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Okay. You got a big to-do list. So, okay. so. Dave's been talking about timelines, which of course are a wonderful visualization tool. Talking about the geographic type of research and plotting out newspapers, of course, and how wonderful it's a small town, so you can get some of the, yeah. <laughs> the juicy stuff in there. And um, and of course, just like you say, sometimes working through the negative aspect of the of the proof. Um, how about this? To help you out on the newspaper side, I can help you in the geographic. I'm going to get you copies of Google Earth for Genealogy Volume 1 and Volume 2 so okay. that you can go home and get some plotting and really get those in a visual format. We'll get you a copy of my book, How to uh, Find Your Ancestors in Newspapers. <laughs> Thank you. And um, it just sounds like you have an incredible story. I mean, how much fun yeah. is that? It's been fun looking at it, <laughs> reading Feel all the different things. Feel energized to maybe take it on again, oh, take yeah. it to the next step. <laughs> So Wonderful. Well, Dave, thank you. thank you so much. Well, thank you for this because, it, like, like again, this, this was such a neat story. Yeah. I looked at it at first and it seemed a bit confusing to me, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. But, 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 but then diving into it and realizing, this is fascinating. My ancestors suddenly seem so boring compared with yours. You know? You're luckier. Sure. So thank you. Wonderful. For, thank you for inviting me, Tom. You bet. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, Thank you so much from Roots Tech. We'll talk to you soon. Profile America, Saturday, May 4th. By presidential proclamation, this month recognizes one of the nation's fastest growing population groups, those of Asian and Pacific American heritage. The observance began in 1978 with a joint congressional resolution honoring the arrival of the first Japanese immigrants in the 1840s and the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1870 with the help of Chinese immigrants. Now, 18.2 million people in the U.S. are of Asian heritage, approaching 6% of the total population. California has the largest number of this group at around 5.8 million. Hawaii is the state where Asians make up the highest proportion of the total population at 57%. You can find more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Thanks so much for joining me for this Genealogy Gems podcast, episode number 154. Now, head to the show notes because we've got lots of good information there for you for episode 154. You can find the Genealogy Gems podcast show notes by going to genealogygems.com, click podcast, and navigate your way, follow the links to episode number 154. And there you're also going to find the video versions of the two interviews that you heard on today's show. If you have any questions or comments, of course, get a hold of me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, or you can leave a voicemail on the voicemail line at 925-272-4021. Okay, thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.